very much for that. Yes, my name's Tom Robinson, and uh, I'm a recovering moron farmer. Uh, it's uh, taken us a few years to, uh, to build the system we're in now. So yes, the 1870 is, uh, is actually when my family uh, came to the region and, and cleared land and, and started farming, and we've been grain growers, basically grain growers pretty well ever since. So here we go. So driving into my local town, Balaclava, and uh, driving in and I could see this big cloud of dust and the dust was going right over the township of Balaclava and the dust was covering the local hospital. I thought, bloody hell, what the hell's going on here? And, and lad I know, he was out prickle chaining. That sign there is legit. I didn't put that there. That sign there is so the people of Balaclava don't come out and steal the soil off the side of the road and put it into their gardens. So that there was my best opportunistic photo <laughs> of that there. And that above photo is us uh, sowing sunflowers into a multi-species cover. And what I want to say about this is that we have the right to choose on how we farm. And we're very grateful here in Australia that we get to choose how we farm. In America, there's lots of rules and regulations and subsidies and through the UK. We are very lucky that we get to make the decisions on our farm every day. Dad transitioned into uh, minimum till into the early 90s. And then Dad purchased a, a John Deere disc seeder in 2002. So, and then there's been a hell of a journey since then. So I purchased a, a John Deere disc seeder. It's been heavily modified. Uh, we were no livestock for 28 years. Dad had a um, stud merino. And then when continuous cropping happened, he got rid of all the sheep. And then when Cassie came along, she wanted some cattle. So that started that journey. Uh, we, uh, we also run a Shelbourne stripper header, been on controlled traffic. Uh, we've reduced our fertiliser inputs and um, using liquid urea. For those people who don't know what a stripper header is, um, it's basically a, uh, a, a machine that goes on the front of the harvester and it basically just picks the heads off the wheat, wheat and barley crops. And so that leaves our stubble standing as high as we can possibly get it. So, and for those people that are doing no-till, knife points and disc seeders, residue management starts at harvest. And that is so critical. One of the biggest things we learnt through the South Australian No-Till Farms Association, all your residue management must be done at harvest with the, with the combine. Spread your residue evenly across the soil and then make sure your piece of machinery that you're going to be sowing the next crop can then get through it. And then so what we find is with the disc seeder and the stripper front, we get reduced hair pinning. So that really long straw flows through the disc seeder and we don't get any hair pinning. Hair pinning is when the disc won't cut the straw and the straw V's into the bottom of the slot. So a good friend of mine, Rick Beaver, says that you know disc seeder and stripper front is like running a comb through your hair and if the straw is anchored, the disc will part through and sow the seeds into the ground. So by doing this, we're making our own microclimate. So those little plants you know, growing underneath that nice tall wheat stripper straw. Um, you know, we're shading that from any of our hot early winds um, and also we're, you know, lowering evaporation rates as well. So fire, fire was brought up this morning. This is what fire does in a system like ours. We had a lightning strike behind mum and dad's house. That is what the distance, that is what fire does to our system. That is what ground cover does to our system. So that there is, is where the fire went through. Um, the moisture saved by the stubble is absolutely huge. And interesting enough, we are struggling, we've been struggling with ryegrass on that patch for three, nearly four years. So if people tell you that fire cures ryegrass problems, it does not, it makes it worse. We also do control traffic, um, which is keeping all the wheel marks on our machinery uh, lined up on the same wheel marks. So typically in a normal you know, traffic system, it's about 75 to 100% of the, the paddock is trafficked. Um, we're at about 15% with us. So that's what our system would look like. We've got a boom spray up the top there, uh, you know, our cedar and, and say a, um, a header. Uh, what we're finding on some of our soil types, especially our sandy loam soil types, we are getting a 40% yield increase, not increase on, with controlled traffic. How do we make a house base or a road base? Sand, water, compaction. And you work it, and you add water, and you roll it. 
and you add water and you work it and you roll it. What do you get? A hard surface. And that's what we were doing on our loam sands. So through controlled traffic, we're minimising our compaction and, um, and we're seeing those, yield, those upper yield increases. On our heavier loam soil types and our clay soil types, not a, big, not a bigger yield advantage. I'd probably, on our heavier clays, not a big difference. But on our western sands, big difference. Um, and also we're seeing faster inf water infiltration rates as well where we're doing uh, you know, outside of those controlled traffic lines. Also, you know where your compaction is. So you're managing your compaction. So on our drill or, and, or on a planter, you can add extra springs and extra down pressure to where that compaction is to make sure you're sowing the seeds to the perfect depth. Disadvantages to control traffic is teaching old dogs new tricks. That's where Dad turned around between runs and that, should, that was still showing up two years later. Um, and then when we, so, so full control traffic, we, uh, to match everything up, um, we brought a combine on tracks. They were getting so heavy, they hold more and more grain. Um, so we went to, um, to track machinery to try and spread the load out. And we've also got a track tractor as well that's on control traffic um, to try and, you know, really stay to those control traffic lines. Bit of, bit of talk about um, cover cropping or... We'll, been mucking around with cover cropping since 2009-2010. Uh, um, I looked at the rainfall records and I reckon about four years in ten we've got an opportunity to do something. This is uh, pre-livestock days. So uh, we were growing cover crops and then spraying them out. That's my dad Ashley. Um, this here is on some loam sand out west of the Blythe Road. Just We note they're the different root systems so you can see that's a, you know, a tillage radish that loves those loam sands. That's a sunflower, so you can see there it's got those surface roots with that great big tap root going down chasing a heap of zinc. And then that's a sorghum plant, so you can see all that really fibrous roots. So that's why we mix up our, our species to get that diversity of root systems through our soil. Uh, there's a Sanford project where we had two moisture probes side by side, and that summer the cover crop had used 30 millimetres of water by the time we got through to seeding time. This is what the wheat sowed through that cover crop looks like. So that wheat germinating and coming through. Uh, 2015 cover crop, this is pre-cattle, and that's the one that we sowed, um, sowed sunflowers into. 2016, we, uh, we didn't sow anything, but we had all this regenerated sorghum come through. So we had a shower rain during, during harvest after we'd wrapped the crop and all this sorghum popped up. Well, we have done a little bit of companion cropping. Um, I'd love to do more of it in the future, and we will. Um, it is just a, it's a bit of a, um, an interesting one, um, finding markets and things like that. Um, we have done a bit of summer cropping as well. We've done 15-minute fallow where we've had mung, grown mung beans and then on back sown canola right next to it. Uh, 26, uh, sorry, 2017, we did some chickpeas and linseed. So these are some realities that we're finding around companion cropping. Sometimes you may need to apply an input, but it's only for half the crop. So things like canola and peas, you might need to, say, spray heliothus out the peas, but you're applying it over the canola anyway. Um, additional on-farm, yeah, available on-farm storage. Um, extra labour requirement to clean the grain, extra cost to clean the grain, start small and scale up. Uh, and companion cropping does work, you just need to really make sure it's going to pay the bills. And every time we've done it, yes it does work, but when you pencil it out, um, you know, the extra cleaning costs, the storage and handling, extra labour units and all those things. If we could find a market that would accept our mixed grains, that would be amazing. But you take a sample of grain to Lauke's or Ridley's or whoever and they cannot handle that system. They are so used to just looking at wheat and barley and peas. They cannot, they cannot process that at the moment. But we would love to find a market to be able to get a mixed species grain crop into. Not all cover crops look great. 
And, uh, you know, a good friend of mine, Dave Brandt, you know, he'd always say, you're always going to have failures. Well, yes, we do. Um, you know, that's one of, the, one of the cover crops we put in. You know, you spent $50 a hectare sowing it and, say, another $20 or $30 a hectare on seed, and it grows that big and dies. That's just some of our summers. So cover cropping for low rainfall. So opportunistic. Uh, Milo, so sorghum uh, and sunflowers are extremely drought tolerant. They are the two that I would always go for in the mix. Sorghum and sunflowers, they're my two go-tos. Uh, easier to grow a mixed species. Um, in the winter time, which we are doing, cover crops and livestock are a no-brainer. Make dollars from your cover crops. Do your own, farm, own on farm trials, and also we're trying to make a bit of end by growing some legumes in our cover crops as well. Uh, you need to earn the right to grow cover crops first in low rainfall. You need to save the water first to then be able to grow it, not the other way around. So you've got to save the water, you know, no till, zero till, full stub retention, do everything right, and then add the cover crop into the rotation. Don't do it the other way around. Um, Cover crops and livestock is a no-brainer. So as I was a grain, when I was a, just a grain grower, cover crops didn't stack up. Now we have livestock in the rotation, they stack up. So first mob of cattle arrived in um, August 2018, uh, a month before Cassie and I were married. That's a great decision. Um, definitely the biggest learning curve of my life. Um, this was the day before we got married. I thought, oh, well, Cassie's got things pretty handled. We're going to get married tomorrow. So I thought, oh, well, I'll go sow some summer cover crops into where we've been grazing cattle. Uh, this is what, uh, yes, yeah, so they just grazing the, uh, a, a mixed species. We did some swath grazing um, in 2019. So I attempt, attempted to grow an organic wheat crop. Um, had a few too many weeds in it for my liking. So I got a mate in to swath it down and then we, wrote, and then we uh, grazed it with hot wire. So you can see there, we just cut that down and we were given the cattle 30 or 40 feet with by one row, shift them every couple of days. We also do graze a bit of stripper straw as well, but we're always making sure we keep 100% of ground cover all the time. This is my bale grazing experiment on some saline ground. That really turned, uh, turned that patch of saline ground ar around. We ended up with you know, a foot, a foot and a half of, um, of hay and straw and cattle shit left over on the ground. And um, that now is actually the best part of the paddock. Now two years on, that's the best part of the paddock. This is our little knife roller that we use for um, knife rolling down the cover crop when we're grazing cattle. So we use single strand electric hot wire and we don't want anything touching the hot wire so we've got a little knife roller. So you can see there we just got our little knife roller and then we've got our fencing trailer behind that to put up the single strand. Talking about killing cover crops. So I, I, this was when cattle was expensive and I couldn't buy enough. Just got a big heavy set of rollers and just banged it down with a big set of heavy, heavy rollers. And I reckon if I came, I did use a little bit of Roundup just to um, touch up a bit of ryegrass about a week later. But I reckon if I went back two weeks later with that big heavy set of rollers again and crossed it the other direction, I probably would have got a 90% kill on it. So our tips for running cattle on, um, co on cropping ground, we have no, un we have no unarable. We are 100% cropping. And fitting livestock into a 100% cropping farm is an interesting, interesting challenge. Everything must be portable, portable hot wire, portable water, portable yards. Uh, to get a start, beg, borrow, steal, share, uh, <laughs> cattle and equipment. Good advice from your local region cattlemen in your area. And on dr on dry ground, we use two wires, one hot, one earth. And if cattle get out, so on our farm, we have a three-strike rule. If you get out twice, the third time, you're off to freezer camp or Dublin sale yards. <laughs> That's our water. We've changed troughs. I, I used an IBC to begin with. Uh, we now have a, a longer steel trough on wheels. Uh, one thing was a major saviour. was a, a good vet crush, but it's got to be portable. So we pick it up and, and tow it around and yards as well. Uh, liquid urea, I've been given the warning so I'm going to keep moving. We dissolve our urea uh, and dissolve our urea SOA blend. Um, so we tip it into a, into a tank, we dissolve it and then we spray it out as a foliar. So we're doing two to three passes in on the season. Uh, we've gone from using 60 units of N uh, down to around that 6.4 in the 
low times. Um, so 2014, my, in my moron, we were back at 400,000 to spend on fertiliser. And we've slowly reduced that. Uh, last year we did all foliars, um, but we've learnt that our Junes are just very cold, so we've had to go back and spread a little bit in our June just to help push those crops on. Make sure you're putting a carbon source in your dissolved urea as well. Uh, we do add a little bit of nickel in there to help the uh, enzymes convert the N in the plant. Please do your own on-farm trials with this as well. It's about the profit margin. I was mainly going to talk about saps today, sap testing. We've done a lot of sap testing. Things we've learnt from our sap testing. We have no calcium in our plants, or very little calcium in our plants. We have a lot of calcium in a soil test. The soil tests are not true to what is actually happening in the plant. We have a huge amount of boron down deep. And every good agronomist will say you don't need boron in our area. But we actually need boron in our plants while they're little until it gets to the boron layer and then we become boron toxic. So, uh, and other things we're learning as well is around, you know, levels of silica and levels of phosphorus. Um, the two, gra the two, so that's an old leaf and a new leaf test. Um, so when you th look at this phosphorus one here, see how this phosphorus one is low on the old leaf but high on the new leaf. So that plant is actually pulling phosphorus from the old leaves and putting it into the new leaves. So that needed a phosphorus spray in the, in the next spray that went on. So these are the little things we're learning through sap testing. If you haven't done a sap test, I would highly recommend doing one um, or doing multiples throughout the growing season. Uh, that there is a test on a limestone rise that should have more calcium than that calcium level should be absolutely off the chart and it is not. Our calcium in our soil is not available yet. So that's what it looks like when we go spraying, mixing up a heap of trace elements that we make ourselves, um, making sure we're all compatible. Peter Trelaw has been doing soil testing every month for three years on our farm, nitrogen testing. Our nitrogen spike is at the end of July. The end of July. So we know we need to get our crops up and out the ground. We need to give it a little bit of fertiliser and a little bit of urea through the, just through the cold months of June and halfway through July. But once we get through to the end of July, we get our big nitrogen spike and then we can do our foliar nutrition after that. Our Johnson Sue composts uh, that we're making, we use that as a seed treater. We're treating all our seed with Johnson Sue compost. So pretty simple. Up the auger. Straight up into the truck. Straight to the paddock. So taking the moron out, the moron. Um, we're trying to only apply what is needed when it's needed. These are all the costs that we're trying to drop. This is really annoying me at the moment. Um, this just put it in the tank, it'll be fine. Just put it in the tank. Oh, well, you're going over it. Just put that in the tank. No. You know, let's go and have a look and see if there's bugs out there or let's go and see if there's weeds out there. Let's go see if we need that. Don't spray just in case. Uh, your agronomist needs to understand your economics. <laughs> um, you must earn the right to go low input farming. So, um, mate down the back who's got the big tough, you know, soils. Don't do any of this. This is not for you. <laughs> you know, start with the basics first. Um, you know, when your soil has improved, then you can lower your inputs. Uh, foliar nutrition, though, that is the kickstart, absolute kickstart. If you're not doing foliar nutrition, you're not doing sap testing, that's going to be the way to kick it off. I came up with this, so organic and regenerative and conventional and and where am I going to be? Where do I need to be per season? Every season's different. Every crop's different. Livestock's different. Caretakers are all different. It's all about your context. And then Nashi thought, oh, Nashi can do one better. <laughs> In typical Michael Nash fashion, and he came up with this. So where do we need to be? Now, last year, big, wet season, long, heaps of disease, heaps of insects. As a grain grower, we probably should have been, you know, in here. This intensive, traditional in here. This year, well, it's dried out. Yes, there's a few bugs floating about. You know, we, you know we're back in, in this regen over here space. 
you know, one recipe is not going to work every year and we just need to be absolutely flexible about how we're going to do it. All right, I'm going to hand on to Mr. Cam Banks now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom.